And welcome to the Supernatural Track here at Continual. I'm your host, Gail C. Martin. And today we are talking about the uh, Supernatural Guide to Healthy Fandom. The show has its diehard fans. But within the show, there were diehard fans of other shows. Not only Sam and Dean, but some of the other characters as well. And they showed us the good, bad, and ugly side of being super fans. So let's talk about what we learned about fandom from being fans of Supernatural. But first, let's let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Crowley. I am a professor, assistant professor of communication studies at Gateway Community and Technical College in Northern Kentucky. Okay, Lynn. Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn Zabernis. I am a clinical psychologist and a professor at Westchester University. And my, one of my big areas of research is fan psychology. So I've written a lot of books on fandom. So this is a great topic for me to talk about. Okay, Kayla. Hi, I'm Dr. Kayla Joseph. I use they and she pronouns, and I am based out of the San Francisco Bay Area, also a clinical psychologist, also a psychology of fandom researcher, and am the co-author of the book, Fandom Acts of Kindness, a guide to activism, advocacy, and doing chaotic good. And I'm Gail C. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Kayla write epic and urban fantasy, as Morgan I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance, but all my modern day worlds are one Sam and Dean could walk into and feel right at home. Uh, and I am proudly uh, claiming the title of obsessed fan, which is why I'm here. So let's talk about uh, the fandoms that we see within our own fandoms. Um, and we'll, we'll save a couple of them for a little later, but Dean is addicted to Dr. Sexy. What do we see about being a fan from Dean loving Dr. Sexy? Michelle? Well, he starts out as a denier. He says, you know, well, you know, I, you know, oh, well, that's Dr. Sexy. Well, how did you know that? Uh, uh, um, I don't know. So we, we start out by seeing Dean almost ashamed of his fandom connections and his his fandom and i i think that's also really parallels to a lot of the fandom not just supernatural fandom but other fandoms as well so the the whole you know declaring oneself a member of a fandom unless it is something like sports or you know, something that is more generally generally accepted it, it's almost looked down on but uh, Definitely as all of us. And also I failed to mention before that I too have a little bit of fan studies in my background. I'm working on my PhD and fan studies as well. And so we're seeing this almost resurgence or almost blessing of fandomness that's really come about because of like comic cons and, and things like that. So we, we're seeing, you know, starting out with Dean and his almost, oh no, I, I'm not a fan of Dr. Sexy, but it, it eventually he embraces it and it is something that he finds a lot of joy in and something that he you know, really connects with more so than, uh, I don't know, you know, sports or, or something like that. Okay, Lynn. Yeah, I, I noticed that. I mean, I think everyone noticed that too, because it is a great parallel for the shame, the internalized shame about being a fan that even though fans are really passionate, and I think all of us are aware that we get so much positive stuff from our fandom, we're also really aware that a lot of people do pathologize fandom. So we are, you know, everybody internalizes those same things. So there's a lot of shame. One of the things that I like in this episode in Changing Channels is that even though Dean is kind of ashamed of it and Sam sort of teases him for it, ultimately it's the fact that Dean does show the characteristics that fans are sometimes mocked for. He knows everything about Dr. Sexy, including that he wears cowboy boots and that's what makes him hot. And so when he, that 
Dr. Sexy, who's, of course, the trickster, is not wearing cowboy boots, that's what clues Dean in to something is wrong. So there's this nice kind of subtle underlying message of, okay, yeah, people are maybe going to think this is funny and pick on it and fans get ridiculed. But at the end of the day, you know, that quote unquote obsessive knowledge can come in handy. And that's a theme you see in a bunch of the fandom episodes of Supernatural. So I, I like the way it wasn't heavy handed. Sometimes Supernatural can be a wee bit heavy handed, but it wasn't too heavy handed in that case. So I like that little bit of it. Okay. Kayla. Along those same lines, it's really neat that they, as as a show, look at both affirmational fandom and transformational fandom. And Lynn, that was a really great example of affirmational fandom where that knowledge of canon is really what saves them in that moment. And it's interesting to me because we often associate affirmational fandom or that like knowledge gathering as being more associated with men as fans and transformational being more associated with women. There's a study that just came out recently that actually shows women just participate more in fandom overall. It may actually not be split down those lines, but it's interesting to me that the show, whether intentionally or not, goes in that direction. Of when we see Dean's fandom, it tends to be more affirmational. It's the fact-based kind of fandom versus when we see things about like the fandom around the books, for example, it tends to be more transformational. Uh, yeah, I think we... Um... Those of us who are in a fandom for a show um, have seen that society at large is much more accepting of sports. I mean, hey, if you're a sports guy and you can rattle off all the uh, statistics, isn't that cool? If you're a Star Trek fan and you know all of the episode numbers and you can quote dialogue, uh, that's a little strange, having done that, been there. Um, so there's there's definitely still that that kind of thing. I think Swifties are bringing us a whole different view of things. I mean, they put Beatles fans to shame and go, go girls. Uh, and everybody else who's a Swiftie, they're, they're kind of uh, plowing the road for everybody. But I think that is something we are starting to see, maybe, hopefully, a little bit of change on. Um, now, it's not just Dr. Sexy. We've also got Game of Thrones, and uh, Cass is a fan of Orange is the New Black. Uh, anything we can pick up about fandom from them? But, I mean, I think with, with Cass, a lot of it is he's, he's still kind of figuring out humans. And so watching something that is um, maybe less in his experience, like Orange is the New Black, because he's been a lot of places, but I don't think he's been in a women's prison, as far as we know. Um, there was just a lot that he didn't get, and he was trying to figure out the, the nuances and the culture and the in-jokes and the references, which to me just reinforced Cass as a character being the fish out of water. Um, well, and I think there's something interesting there, too, in kind of the show's meta commentary on streaming services versus what the show is, which is a network TV show that you have to wait a week or more to watch the next episode. And I, I love the interaction between Cass and Dean around Orange is the New Black, where Dean's like, hey, we've all had a binge, but maybe maybe stop watching if you're getting so confused. I thought it was interesting that you know, some of the, the the show does kind of draw a little bit of a distinction between more marginalized fandoms and more mainstream fandoms, because those are two examples of really mainstream fandoms that, you know, those are the traditional stand around the water cooler and talk about what happened on Game of Thrones. And people, that's almost up there almost with sports fandom in that it's socially acceptable. I like that supernatural shows some of its main characters being fans of things that that people look more askance at i mean sam is a a fan of like serial killers you know he would be listening to all the serial killer podcasts if it was 2024 and dean is an anime fan and and uh dr sexy like a soap kind of fan and those things are much more marginalized so i i like that it included both it wasn't just including the ones that these are the okay things for people to like. Mm -hmm. Michelle? 
I think that's also a, a more or less the show's kind of going off what Lynn said, offering that commentary on you know what's acceptable and what's not. And you know, while Supernatural is showing you know, these accepted accepted fandoms, I think it's also recognizing itself as one of those not so accepted fandoms. And for you know various reasons that I know we're going to eventually get into, but uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting kind of. I don't know if maybe that was their attempt of saying like I don't know supernatural fandom should be obviously you know we believe this should be it should be one of those accepted fandoms and by making the characters themselves fans of those accepted fandoms maybe that was I don't know more of a I don't know attempt I guess of kind of validifying some of our some of our fandom mm. obsessions yeah and i thought we one of the most joyous moments was in larp and the real girl when sam and dean got to larp and kind of live out some of their game of thrones <laughs> uh preoccupation they just that joy uh in those final moments when they they race ahead with the swords and it's like it was so wonderful getting to see them be able to play and getting them seeing them be able to take on even just temporarily characters who didn't carry the burden that they carry. And I think that goes with a lot of fandom too, is fandom is an escapist medium. Fandom is where we go to find a safe place. And that can be whether it's a soap opera or whether it's a drama series or comics, you know, fandom is where we go to have fun with other people who get it and get away from all the stuff we don't like. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a good, healthy escape. Um, I feel like they did a really good job in LARP and the Real Girl by portraying LARPers as a LARPer myself and have been for, for many, many years. I, the way that they slightly tongue in cheek, but also respectfully showed mm -hmm. those LARPers as being, you know, it, it is our escape. It is a time where we can shrug off the rest of the world and go be, you know, a goblin or go be a, a fighter or something like that for a weekend. And the, even though there was a little bit of you know, Dean kind of taking on that voice of, you know, the the larger masses of, you know, you weirdos and you know, what are you what are you doing out there? They, I think, the show did a really good job in showing the, I guess, realness of that particular escapism and not in the other kind of making fun of it ways that media has started to and still continues to portray live action role plays. Well, and that's true. Live action role plays and Renaissance festivals are another whole set of fandoms and immersive um, realities where you can get as deep into that as you want to. Um, I grew up very near uh, the site that is Cooper's Lake, which is the site for the Pensig Wars, which if you are involved in LARPing or Renaissance festivals, you've heard of because it's a massive gathering in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, I have a lot of friends who go, tents, um, musicians, battles, it's all there have spread out over the hillside for I think a couple of weeks. So it's it's pretty immersive. And that's that's another type of fandom because there's a big investment of time and energy in the costuming and, and gaining skills for uh, an organization like the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is one step sideways from LARPing. Um, you know, that's, that's a very big fandom of its of sorts. Um, you know, the other the other thing about mm -hmm. that, since you brought up LARP and the Real Girl, I, I, one of the things that I think was so, I don't know, impactful might be too strong a word, but I don't know, I'm going to go with impactful. It was impactful that Supernatural showed its two heroes, you know, the two main protagonists. It wasn't just side characters that were shown as fans or that fanning was okay for them. It was actual Sam and Dean Winchester. So. 
you know, seeing them, even though there was that initial hesitation and, oh, we've got to tow the company line, toxic masculinity, look at these silly people dressing up, blah, blah, blah. That wasn't the lesson of it. And both of them were able to really find joy in it and support each other. Like they completely gave up their dismissing of it. And that's an unusual thing for two characters like Sam and Dean Winchester. Like we talk a lot about tropes of tro toxic masculinity and what Supernatural had to say about masculinity, but it has some really positive things to say about, you know, you can be the stereotypical hero and you can also really enjoy LARPing and be kind of unshamed about it. And that that's an unusual thing. I didn't even really, I mean, I've written a book chapter on how Supernatural depicted fans, but even so, I didn't really realize until I started looking through things for this panel just how often they depicted fans and how much they depicted Sam and Dean as fans. It, it's mm -hmm. really kind of striking. Well, and, and since Charlie was in LARP and the Real Girl, let's go back to, you know, her whole, um, she's got a tattoo of Princess Leia on a 20-sided die. Hey, it was Comic-Con. I was drunk. All right, that alone says to anybody who has been to Comic-Con, sober or not, uh, we know exactly what's going on here. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about Charlie and her fandoms. Um, anybody want to dive in on that one? Kayla? Sure. Um, I think Charlie's really interesting in where she shows up in the series because we had had Becky before we had Charlie as kind of the archetype of the fangirl. And we obviously see transformation of Becky over time. But Charlie feels like more accurate representation from day one when she shows up. Um, you know, she's the kind of what you think of when you think of a computer geek. She's into gaming. She's into LARPing. She's into many of the things that we would be into as fans. And then she also gets these really cool adventure arcs where she gets to go into the things that she's a fan of. And I don't know that a lot of other people get to do that often, except for maybe Dean when he gets to do Western stuff. Mm -hmm. That's true, because she was a big fan of Oz, and she gets to go to Oz. Yeah, Lynn? Sorry. She's also undeniably heroic. I mean, there there isn't even any ambivalence at this point about portraying her as a hero of the story, which, again, I do think you you almost can't look at her character without thinking about the Becky character, because I think Robbie Thompson who had watched all of the series pretty much before that was perfectly aware of Becky and her evolution and the controversy about that character. And he really did write Charlie with a, a much deeper knowledge of the actual fandom than I think most of the writers of Supernatural had. I just don't think they had spent as much time with fandom. I mean, having spent a lot of time with Robbie Thompson myself personally talking about fandom in depth, I know he knew a lot about fandom and knows a lot about fandom. And so I do think that her character was consciously written to get rid of some of those more damaging stereotypes. She was also one of the first queer characters that was like a major character. So fandom, I think when, when she came on, I remember when she started on the series and all of us were just like, oh my God. Like, okay, that is us. Like, we really can't talk about representation. We really can see ourselves in her. So the fact that she got to be such a sympathetic character and so nuanced and so real, not perfect by any means, but, you know, very heroic and very appealing and very much a fangirl. I think that was that was a real gift to, to this fandom and to fandom in general. Mm -hmm. And then they killed her and that didn't go over well. <laughs> Understand. Michelle. Uh, going off of what Lynn was saying about showing Charlie as you know, a real representation, we can also, a uh, fandom, we also can see in Charlie's relationships. So in LARP and the Real Girl, you know, there's the line where it's, you know, if the tent is a rock and don't come a knock it or something like that. And so it's not only that she is a participant in other fandoms, but she also finds friends and she finds romantic partners and you know, showing that it isn't just 
you know, the, the fandom doesn't stop with her, that it, it is possible. It is a reality that you make lifelong friends and you, you have these connections with people that, you know, without fandom would not have happened. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a very important message and also really reflective of the, the supernatural family that has grown you know, and really still continues to grow uh, because of the show. Mm -hmm. Which again is like a commentary on Becky too, because repeatedly in multiple episodes, Becky is referred to as sad, lonely, pathetic, and you know, she's infantilized, you know, living in a little kid looking bedroom and doesn't know what a real relationship is. So the Charlie character was like, nah, -uh. that's not, that's not what's happening in fandom. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what about, we brought up Sam's fascination with serial killers, which just seems interesting given what they do for a living and how they appear to outsiders as well maybe serial killers um what what do we take away from somebody who's kind of immersed up to the elbows in blood and gore every day as part of his job being interested in serial killers uh what does that tell us about sam uh michelle i think that's sam's attempt at normality so he's he's listening to the serial killer podcasts and 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 true crime and whatnot and what what is the line that you know demons i get people are crazy and so it's not you know it, it, it's it's sam's attempt to i don't know find a, a little bit of normal human re interaction within his world of supernatural terrors and everything and it, I, th I think it also makes him a little bit more of an interesting character be in the sense that, yes, without you know the 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 boy's actual you know attention focused on supernatural creatures, they absolutely would be considered serial killers and, and you know had been hunted down at some points because of that. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's just Sam's attempt to be normal in a way. Well, I just think about that scene where Adam Bass and the Gollum are sitting in the back seat of the Impala and they're watching Sam and Dean burn a grave and Sam just casually puts his hands out to warm them. Adam goes, my God, they're psychopaths. <laughs> you know, if, if you're watching from the outside, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, Lynn. It's interesting. I think also that the show several times shows how whatever the boys are fans of is also kind of an attempt at mastery of all the violence and uncontrolled, you know, the, the violent things that happen to them and their family and innocent people. I think sometimes the things that they fan are attempts at, at mastering that, you know, being knowledgeable about serial killers and following these podcasts and knowing what happened. That's, that's kind of a measured way of engaging with the kind of violence and evil that they have to engage with on an everyday basis, but you can master it when you're just listening to a podcast and it's somebody else talking about it and you can master it by amassing a whole lot of knowledge about it. I think that was a little bit of um, their obsession, their mutual fanning of wrestlers also, because that's also violence, but it's controlled violence instead of the kind of out of control violence that they can't control. And, you know, a, a, the good guy like usually wins. It's it's probably why they like horror films too. Like in horror films, usually the bad guy gets comeuppance and the good guy wins in the end. So I think all of those things are an attempt at some mastery for two men mm -hmm. who have to deal with out of control violence all the time. And I think in real life, that's some of what fandom is about too. The things that we're drawn to in fiction are the things that we're looking to get some kind of mastery over in a kind of controlled environment, which is why I hate any kind of shaming of people for whatever mm -hmm. they happen to be fans of. Okay, Kayla. 
Well, I think Dean specifically names that with horror movies in one of the episodes in the later seasons where Sam's asking him, why are you even watching this like cheesy horror film? He's like, well, because it's it's predictable. It's it's what we do, but it's predictable. And so there's something comforting there. And, you know, to that point around mastery, there's a lot of criticism that gets lobbed at folks who are into true crime as like romanticizing true crime or sexualizing true crime. And the vast majority of folks who are into true crime are trying to understand why people do awful things, oftentimes because they themselves have been the victims of awful things or know people who have been the victims of awful things. And so it makes a lot of sense that Sam, given what the boys do, would be looking to things like true crime to understand, well, why do things like this happen? Well, and I think there is a there's a desire that says if i can understand this crazy thing this bad thing that happened to me then just in my understanding i've regained some control um and i i can definitely see that where the thing you're you study the thing you're afraid of to give yourself control over the thing you're afraid of so that makes a lot of sense to me uh, but I want to come back to two of the fandoms you mentioned, which is wrestling and then Dean's love of horror movies, which, you know, Sam says, Dean, our lives are horror movies, but particularly like Mint Condition with All Saints Day and watching Dean and the friend geek out over, okay, which which of the movies is the best? Well, oh, definitely three. And they, they, they have this incredibly normal geek discussion over a horror movie series and in beyond the map when they go into the wrestling world the joy on their faces we don't usually get to see sam and dean looking joyous but cheering for those wrestlers whose violence is all supposed to be fake um in their very real violent world just seeing their joy um you know I, both of those struck me at first as unlikely fandoms but you know now I think about it uh, there's definitely some connections there Michelle definitely definitely with the wrestling and part of that goes back to why they got into wrestling in the, to begin with which is something that they did with their dad and it seems like for both of them that was a positive memory that they had with John so even then as adults reliving and going back you know, sitting ringside watching it, it it's not only that they are enjoying the faked violence and the the scripted violence but it's also harkening back to a, a memory of childhood that you know obviously the boys don't have a lot of positive childhood memories and so when they come across something also like with scooby-doo when they come across something that is you know positive from their past they are going to latch on to it which is you know the same thing that we do outside you know outside of the supernatural world you know the, the reason that you like a certain show or in fact the reason I like wrestling is because it's something that I did with my friends at a certain time in my life and it was fun and so now whenever I catch a match or something it's it, it just reminds me of those better times. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Yeah I, I, I mean they even they talk about that overtly in the episode so we know that canonically Sam and Dean watched wrestling with John and it was something that they were all into so I think part of its power is is in the nostalgia of it which you know we know that nostalgia is actually really good for people I just did a an article in psychology today about nostalgia as it relates to fandom you know for the reason you know during the pandemic the first part of the pandemic People were, you know, the troubles, the first part of the trouble, sorry. Um, people were really like watching Friends again and again and again, because even though it had aired a long time ago, they got that feeling of nostalgia that they were kind of transported to like a simpler time or a time when it reminded them of a bond with someone. And that's really good for people. So I think 
part of the reason Sam and Dean were so joyous together and showed that's one of the rare episodes where they really demonstrate kind of unfettered joy, both of the two of them together. So it becomes a current here and now bonding experience for the brothers based on the bonding experience that it was for them in childhood. And Dean, you know, gets to almost go back to being a child when he sneaks into the ring when he doesn't think anyone's there and just like he looks like he becomes five years old and he's in the ring acting it out. And we find out that Sam had a crush on Rio and I guess carried her poster from motel to motel and taped it up on the ceiling, which is not very plausible, but I thought was cute anyway. So yeah, that's a, that's a really nice episode because of all that, as you said, joy. Okay. Kayla. Well, and we were talking earlier about how Supernatural really highlights the boys being into the less stereotypic fandoms in, in terms of what we typically think of as fandoms that adult men are into, we almost never see them really talk about sports except for wrestling. That's that's actually one of the only sports that we hear them talk about. And of the sports fandoms, I would say that's probably more on the fringe compared to like baseball, football, et cetera. And so it's interesting that that was one of the choices that they made for an episode for a central focus. And it makes a lot of sense with kind of supernatural on the whole tends to lean towards things that are very campy because they're fun to play with and fun to have the meta commentary with and wrestling is very campy um, around masculinity especially and so it fits in really nicely with all of those themes from the show and interesting that that's you know, one of the few times we really hear them talk about sports. Well I think one of the other things that strikes me with wrestling and with um, the horror movies um, is that, and, and with Scooby-Doo, is that they are all very clear on good and evil. If you watch wrestling, and, and I, I was actually on a wrestling podcast at one point because a friend of mine said, you don't know anything about this. That's what we need for this podcast here. Be honest. <laughs> um, but I have friends who are very into it and, and there are all these made up personas and somebody is the evil guy and somebody is the hero and they have these backstories and yes, it is all fake right down to busting light bulbs over people's heads, but, uh, and chairs. Um, but there is that narrative of good defending over evil and in Scooby-Doo, you know, which we can talk about next, um, there is the, the good and the evil, even if the bad guys usually turn out to be real estate developers in a mask. Um, horror movies, also, usually there is a, a good versus evil component there. Um, and unlike in the real world, the bad guys get what's coming to them, what they deserve, even if that doesn't happen all the time in real life. So um, let's talk about Scooby-Doo because Dean is an unabashed fan of that dog. Uh, and I've Full disclosure here, I, I have every DVD in all of the Scooby-Doo series because that's one of my other comfort shows. So I'm just fully down the rabbit hole on this. Uh, Michelle? Um, I mean, what's more classic than Saturday morning cartoons than Scooby-Doo? And as you said, it's definitely that it, it's, with Scooby-Doo, it's very visible signs of good versus evil. There's even very visible signs of, you know, that particular book on the shelf is the one that you have to pull in order to, you know, open up the trap door. And so there, there's, there's really that overt choices, I guess, and, and, and overt messages of this is what you do next. This is good. This is evil. And I think especially in the case of Sam and Dean, where they have many many choices that are not that clear and are you know that the, they don't have books that are color-coded against the background to show them you know, hey th this is the book you need to look for in the lore so you know one of those kind of i guess going back to the childhood things where you know, back when things were simple and back when things were easy and back when choices you know weren't life and death and and their lives and other people's lives weren't always on the line okay Lynn? That's also another really good example of how the show is 
demonstrating something that happens in real life that it is also really positive about real life fandom because they, the boys love Scooby-Doo because that was a source of comfort and consistency in their chaotic, constantly uprooted childhood. And that's why it became so important to them. Dean said, uh, there was a line in that one, no matter where dad dragged us, there was always Scooby-Doo. And in a way, like they they were their role models, like they were how they learned some of their values. They were they were where they learned about good guys and bad guys, in addition to what John was teaching them. But it was teaching them in a way that was, you know, displaced a little, was not so real, was not so terrifying, did have the good guy prevailing over the bad guy. So I love that they've taken that with them like throughout their entire lives because they didn't have a lot of comfort and consistency. And I love that we see in that episode in the present how much Dean is still valuing being able to have that escape sometimes. You know, they're buying the big screen TV and he's like, you know, be careful. She's delicate. Don't hurt her. Like he really values. He didn't have big screen TVs and possessions when he was growing up. He didn't have a way to kind of escape into his fandom unless they were lucky enough to have a TV in a motel that got Scooby-Doo. So when he sets up the Dean cave, that's like a real valuing of what escape into a fandom can offer. That's exactly what he's planning to do in the Dean cave. There's a spot for him. There's a spot for Sam. There's a couple beers and there's a big screen TV where they are going to watch the things that allow them to escape from all the horrors around them. And that's again, a real nice real life message too. Okay. Kayla. Well, it's interesting to see what fans do with that, taking it into our own vanish practices. So I'm, as you were talking about the Dean cave, I was thinking a lot about fan fiction where so much fan fiction within Supernatural, when there's like a moment of quiet and pause, it is almost always in the Dean cave watching a movie and having these these movie nights. And I think that episode really sets that up that, like you said, there's this consistency and this comfort that, you know, up until the bunker, they'd really only been able to kind of get with the Impala and the some level of consistency that CD motels have. But there's this interesting way too, I think that Scooby-Doo gets used that is sort of a crossover in fandoms. And we've seen that with Scooby-Doo throughout its history. There's all sorts of celebrities that pop up in Scooby-Doo, for example. And so to have a crossover like this, like it, it doesn't seem like it should work, but because of what both of these shows are, it works really well, both in illustrating fandom and in just fitting really nicely into both of those universes. Yeah, I have to admit, Scooby-Doo is as much of a comfort watch for me as Supernatural. They're my two top ones because I can watch those and I know that it's going to be okay. Um, and so I, I totally I totally get that. Before we go to talk more about uh, Becky, uh, which we'll close out on, I wanted to bring up Dean's fascination with Westerns. But also before we get too far away from um, Charlie and D&D, I want to point out that D&D is an interesting fandom to come up in Supernatural because it is a complicated game that is always run by a dungeon master. Nothing happens in a D&D game that is completely spontaneous. It's either ruled by the dice or the will of the dungeon master who controls the whole thing, which is sort of meta for this show since we had, you know, Chuck, a.k.a. God. Um, but having also played a lot of D&D, &D, um, that's, that's something that strikes me as sort of very much a metaphor for the game because Chuck is the dungeon master and he's, he's not only running the game, he's got fixed dice uh, for most of the run. And so uh, that's just sort of an interesting thing to come up because it, it's... Um, very much connected. Um, so Westerns, another genre of fandom where there's a clear good guy and a clear bad guy, those black hats. And Dean is right there in his Clint Eastwood serape, uh, <laughs> which is an interesting choice if you're going to pick which TV cowboy you follow. 
Clint's kind of a shoot first and ask questions later version compared to say John Wayne. Um, thoughts about the whole Western thing, uh, Michelle? I mean, with the whole, with the Westerns, it kind of likes, you know, with Scooby-Doo and like you said, it's, there's that clear good and bad. And then also you have the hero of the Western that has this set moral code. And that's one of the, that's one of the hallmarks of the Western genre. And that just in the way that the movies are portrayed, very rarely does the hero deviate from their own moral code. And that leads them, of course, into saving the damsel in distress, saving the town, you know, any anything along those lines. So it, it's, I think it's another opportunity that Dean has to really invent himself or reinvent himself based on what he saw and his fandoms. And I think when, you know, uh, that, the time when he does go back into the western and he finds out like wait a minute you mean the life you know life in the 1800s really wasn't this way it really throws him for a loop and he doesn't really know how to manage himself in that situation once he finds out that you know nice blanket and the whiskey tastes like gasoline and the the women in the bars are not you know what they what they are portrayed to be and so not only are we seeing you know that kind of internal conflict within dean that we get to see a oh my gosh this type of person that i've based my life on it's not real and so you know he he we don't get to see a lot of it in the show but i have to wonder like you know as he's as he's going to bed at night it's like you know what do i do now that the good guys aren't Clint Eastwood or John Wayne. They're just, you know, the the coward that was the, the sheriff or the deputy or, or or something along those lines. I'm, I don't know. I think that that just, I didn't prepare anything for the Western. So that, that was literally just brain vomit. But uh, I think I made a good point. <laughs> you did. You did. Lynn? Yeah, no, you did make a good point. And I didn't prepare for that one either. I totally forgot that that did have Spanish moments in it. But it, it it reminded me of what I thought of when I was thinking of some others. You know, the great thing about Supernatural is that you can analyze it on so many different levels, which explains why we're all still talking about it and fascinated by it now. Um, and one of the sort of subtler themes that they tackle in some episodes, and I think this is one of them, is that fandom is basically most of the time a good thing and escape most of the time is a good thing. But that also fantasy is not reality and you have to keep that line. So in this case, Dean's fantasy of what being a cowboy or being in a Western in the 1800s would be like, it doesn't really turn out to be good. Like it's great to escape into fantasy, but if you start to think that you can live in that fantasy, that's not so good. Same with like monster movie with the Dracula, mm -hmm. Dracula character, you know, being a fa he wanted to escape from a traumatic childhood where his father was beating him. So he escaped into a world where he was a monster. Monsters could be the strong ones. And that could be, again, a safe, healthy escape fantasy. But when you start enacting it in reality, then it just makes you a murderer who's going to be killed in the end. So I do think there's also Supernatural often is doing a couple things at once in episodes. And that's a thread that runs through some of them. No, that's great. I, I'd forgotten about monster movies, so it's a great pickup. Kayla? Well, and like we were talking about earlier, in the canon of the show, they are sort of gunslinging outlaws themselves who are also heroes, very much like the Western. And I would imagine that that's probably something helpful for Dean to lean on as a way to make the job tolerable. So, you know, fans often take the lessons that we learn from things like Supernatural and, and other things that we fan over and apply that to hard times in our own lives. And so thinking about how, you know, I would imagine for Dean, 
going out into the world and thinking of himself as, you know, a Clint Eastwood or a John Wayne type character might be a little bit easier than thinking about the reality of what he actually does every day. Well, especially since in Westerns, yes, we have the whole sheriffs and, and um, the town marshal and all that, but we also have the lone gunslinger who just goes out and meets out vengeance. And Sam and Dean aren't real law enforcement. They're not FBI for real. They're not, they don't have a real authority behind them. Um, so they, they are kind of the modern gunslinger that is also part outlaw as well as justice dealer outer. Um, so that is kind of an interesting uh, comparison. So in the last uh, bit of this, let's talk about Becky. Becky is kind of the famous supernatural fan. She starts out in one place, but in her final moments, she's come a long way and we see quite a, a difference from when we first meet her to when she stares down Chuck, knowing exactly who he is and what it might cost her. Um, and, and in between, there is that supernatural convention with Chuck and um, at, the, at the old hotel. So let's, let's talk about Becky. Um, Michelle? Becky is definitely that character that does not have that break between fantasy and reality. And knowing that she was written as you know, really a commentary on the supernatural fandom in general. And you know, when she first came onto the scene, it was kind of like a slap in the face. You know, the, the, with Kripke acknowledging, hey, you know, we've got these, we got these crazies out here. And um, yeah, we've got these crazies out here. So especially with her starting where she, did as that crazed obsessed fan and then she you know, like you said with the convention and then we also see her pop back up in season seven when she marries sam and so so we can see that at least for seven years she's got this really horrible outlook on fandom and or or her fantasy rather and she becomes that embodiment of the bad side of fandom but by the by the end of her story arc, when she's staring down Chuck, she's has a more healthier relationship with it. She recognizes the break between fantasy and reality. She still has a creative outlet. She you know, she makes those miniatures and and you know has a has a side business as that. And so she still finds a creative way in order to express her fandom. But it's no longer that all consuming life that she had been living. And so I, it, it's a it's a nice it's a nice story arc I think for for any fan because I mean we all start out as you know soul crushingly obsessed with things at least I do and then over time it's kind of like okay now this has just become a part of my life that I can look at this in a healthier way. Okay, Lynn. I have really mixed feelings on Becky um, when she in her first introduction. I actually liked Becky and I recognized that, I mean, I thought that the portrayal of Becky that Kripke wrote, which was the first two episodes that she was in, it was a time when Kripke was getting meta for the first time and like messing around with these affectionate pokes at both fandom and the show and the cast and the business. And like, he was really starting to become savvy about how all of it fit together. And I saw his portrayal, his character of Becky as one of those affectionate critiques more than, oh, you crazy fans, I can't stand you. I mean, he was on, you know, the television without pity message boards for years. He, he uh, like Robbie Thompson, he did have an understanding of fandom. I, I had just met him at that time in season three and we were I had a lot of conversations with him about fandom and so I know he was really he had great questions and he was really thoughtful about it so I I kind of was okay with that initial portrayal it was a critique it was a poking fun but I didn't feel like he was trying to say that Becky really was over that line like there's a point when She's talking to Chuck and she says something like, look, I know they're not real. And then he says, Becky, it's all real. And she goes, I knew it. 
And I loved that because it's kind of that tension between, look, I'm not delusional. Fans are not delusional. Like we know this isn't real. And yet at the same time, it feels so real to us and, and sometimes has such real benefits that we have that ambivalence. And I thought that was just the best conversation to bring it out. So I saw his portrayal of her and Emily's portrayal of her as, as affectionate at first. And then came season seven time for a wedding, which most of the time I just decide is not part of Supernatural because I hate it with a fiery passion because the people who wrote that did not understand the idea of affectionate poking and critique at all and just turned her into just what Michelle was saying, just this absolute pathologizing, horrible portrayal of a fan that didn't really have any relevance to real life. So I'm glad that she got to come back at the end and actually be redeemed and, and have some kind of evolution. What an interesting evolution that character got to have. Yeah, absolutely. Kayla? Well, I think that her evolution also, in a lot of ways, mirrors the evolution of the show in general with its parasocial relationships with the fandom that you know, there was that sort of, well, what are, what are we doing here? What is this? How are we going to explore this? And then there was some maybe not great explorations that happened kind of in the middle of the seasons. And then as we started to get towards the end and it started to get very meta in 15, I think there was a really nice way that Becky was used to talk back directly to fans, both about what the show was setting up as it moved towards the end, but also just about how that relationship had evolved that, you know, this is, this is how we saw you in the beginning. We actually see you much more as you actually are now, which is grounded, realistic, you know, three-dimensional characters, um, just like we're all three-dimensional people. And so I think that that's, I also have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with that character, mostly also because of that, that episode with the wedding, but um I think by the end, what they did with that was really cool and something that really only works in a show like Supernatural. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, I think that there is sometimes an arc with being a fan, depending on what point in your life you start to become a fan, where there is that initial honeymoon phase where you are just besotted with the show and the rest of the people in your life are going can we talk about something else please once in a while and there's that initial kind of oh my god I've just found this best thing and it makes me feel so good and I want to proselytize it to the world and then you know gradually most of us learn how to tamp that down and, and direct it um so I think that part is very real um there's certainly been situations in real fandom, like the infamous flying girl who decked Jensen at a convention, um, that have been over the line. Um, and so I think it's an interesting dance and, and an interesting maturity. The fandom is now 18 years. Um, the people who were teeny boppers at the beginning are not teeny boppers anymore. And even teeny boppers has so much of a fandom connotation uh, as a term. So I think um, I'm glad that Becky got to grow up. And I think we see Becky going from someone who was lonely and alienated and isolated and probably didn't have a lot of friends and used fandom as a shelter. And many of us have been there um, to somebody who learned how to incorporate fandom without giving it up when other parts of their life started to fill out and blossom and mature. And came into a different understanding of fandom, but didn't have to let go of it. And that's a really beautiful thing. Um, well, we are almost out of town. I wanna to give a quick shout out to Supernatural Musical and Fan Fiction because that's another whole level of fans of the show. Um, and their comments and insights into watching Supernatural certainly set Sam and Dean back on their heels. And, and as we saw when Sam and Dean saw them singing, carry on, I think it's the first time those characters saw, heard that song and thought of it about themselves. And you kind of see that play over their faces as they're seeing that. And it was a really transformative moment. So we are out of time. This has been fantastic. And I'm sure there are 
fandom references we we miss talking about. But uh, before we go, please let everybody know where we can find you online. Uh, Michelle? You can find me on Twitter at at preheating prof. Okay, Lynn? You can find me on all social media at Fangasm SPN, and you can find my books, including Family Don't End With Blood and There'll Be Peace When You Are Done, which are written with the cast of Supernatural, and my new book on the boys. Some people on this panel might have chapters in multiple of those books. Um, you can find them at my website at fangasmthebook.com. All right, Kayla. You can find my book at all places that sell books pretty much. And uh, you can find me on social media, um, on Twitter at always keep nerd writing. And I'm pretty easy to find at galesymartin.com, morganbrice.com. I'm on most of the social medias under one or both of those names. So if you spell them right, you'll find me. I run the Supernatural TFWNC group on Facebook. I'm a columnist for the Winchester Family Business Blog. But most of the time, you can find me here on Continual. So thank you so much for being here. This was so much fun. And thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There will be more Supernatural coming up soon. So we'll see you online.